Okay, so last but not least, we're gonna hear about the STEPS road mapping research roadmap. And uh, with that, I'll invite Kerry Strickland from RTI International. Kerry is the Director of Strategy and Innovation in the Innovation Advisory Team at RTI International, a team that generally provides consulting services to clients uh, pursuing innovation to shape a better future around sustainability. <laughs> As part of STEPS, uh, he has led the development of the team's 2023 publication of the 25 in 25, a roadmap towards U.S. phosphor sustainability. So thank you, Kerry. Okay, hi everybody. Final presentation of the conference. Um, I only have a couple slides that we'll um, go through just as a little bit of a refresher uh, in case you're not familiar with the roadmap or you haven't looked at it in a while. Um, and then we'll have uh, invite some panelists and folks that you've heard from uh, already, Jenna Compton and Jim Elser and Paul Westerhoff will come and we'll have a little bit of reflection and conversation about what the roadmap um, production process last year was like for them, uh, and then what connections they noticed uh, between the presentations from the last couple days and uh, the impact opportunities, the things that we said in the roadmap we think we need to work on. Um, so just a quick um, kind of reminder of why, like why, why are roadmaps important? What's the job of a roadmap? Why should we spend time doing that? The goal really is that the STEPS vision is far too big for STEPS alone to achieve. And in fact, the people that work in STEPS, well, we don't make any decisions about how much fertilizer gets used in farms because none of us are farmers, right? And so what we have to do then is inspire collective action across the whole industry, across the whole sector to move in a coordinated way towards achieving our vision. But the vision is so high level, 25 and 25. If I'm a farmer, how am I supposed to know what I should do? Or uh, you know, if I'm a fertilizer dealer, how am I supposed to know what I should do? Right. So that's the goal of a roadmap, is to take that vision and break it down into impact opportunities and activities or actions that inspire collective action. So that's the number one there, right? Like inspire stakeholder alignment. That's the whole goal and point um, of putting together this roadmap. As we put it together, we knew that like as a, an STC, we wanted it to be grounded in solid science and uh, to take into account the latest scientific advances, a lot of the kind of things that we've talked about over the last couple of days. Um, we wanted it to be as inclusive of the full ecosystem as it could be. Um, this is difficult to do, right? Like, I mean, we, we don't have, um, you know, maybe all the voices in this room and in most of our rooms that we would like to have. Uh, but we tried to go as broad and include as many different kinds of stakeholders as we could. And then um, just a note, because sometimes it's not clear, um, our roadmap is particularly centered on a national viewpoint. Uh, so we're thinking about the 25 and 25 mission vision through the lens of the United States and what actions uh, need to be taken to move towards better phosphorus management. Um, so uh, this, this is, gives you a few screenshots of the roadmap in case you um, haven't looked at it or haven't looked at it in a while. The very last bullet point there tells you where to find it, steps-center.org slash roadmap uh, is where you'll find the full document. Um, it is based on kind of our review of existing similar roadmaps, right? The UK came out with a phosphorus and nutrient management roadmap last year. Um, there's our phosphorus future, which is a global um, roadmap on this topic. So this is not the only document of this kind. Um, so we kind of reviewed and synthesized those other documents along with published research. Then at uh, P Forum last year, we collected input from about 80 stakeholders that were there, and I know a lot of you that are here were involved in that process. 
That helped us distill down to our high level impact areas. What are the you know, top line kinds of things we need to do? Well, we need to optimize use in field. We need to recover value added products from wastewater streams. Um, but then to flesh those out, make those real, um, give them actions, uh, we pulled together working groups to uh, spend some concentrated time on each of those impact opportunities, defining particular actions. And there were about 50 more people involved in that small group um, activity. Um, so it's not a document that like we in steps made up on our own, right? We sought a lot of input and reviewed a lot of research to inform um, what, we, what we came to. Uh, and so there are nine impact opportunities that are uh, defined as part of the roadmap um, that range from things that we've talked about a lot, like optimizing use in field, to things that we haven't talked about very much, like reducing food waste and increasing awareness among the general public about the phosphorus problem um, so that consumers are uh, more willing to kind of vote with their dollars and make choices uh, that are more um, kind of sensitive to their phosphorus footprint. So then each of those um, impact opportunities, like here's the uh, optimized use one, is broken down into short and medium and long-term actions. There are a lot of these. There's a lot of detail there in the roadmap. We won't spend time kind of going through all that um, today. But we will move to our panel. If our panelists want to join me, Paul and Jim and Jana, now would be a great time for you to join us. Let's do kind of just quick introduction. Shannon, would you remind the, the audience the perspective that you bring to the conversation? Ecologist and biogeochemist at the US Environmental Protection Agency, and I'm on the research arm of EPA, which is about 10% of the agency. Great. Um, Excellent. Paul Westroth here at Arizona State University. I'm a professor in environmental engineering. I do things related to phosphorus um, and water and you know a number of other elemental cycles, not as many as, as Jim, but pretty much phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, H2O. I'm Jim Alstrom, I'm director of Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance here at Arizona State University. In my other life, I'm director of the Flathead Lake Biological Station of the University of Montana. Excellent. Thank you all. So my intent was to try to get some variation in perspectives that uh, are brought to the discussion, right? The SPA perspective and then environmental engineering and the STEPS perspective and then the regulatory and toxicology uh, perspective. So um, let's start by talking about the roadmap process a little bit. Um, doing these kinds of big sector roadmaps, it's, it's hard to do. It's always an imperfect process. Um, when you kind of reflect back on your involvement, like what about the process or about the impact opportunities that we arrived to, like what still rings true for you today? What do you feel really good about? And then what's something that you look at now and you think, oh, gosh, like that didn't get enough emphasis in the roadmap. Like we missed that part a little bit. You can just kind of popcorn style. Whoever wants to can you go back jump in one first. Slide? Yeah, and sure. I, uh, Sorry you can't see one. them yeah, that, as that, well. That's a good one, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'll start. Yeah. Um, so I was on the uh, monitoring, enhanced monitoring, I think, mm, mm -hmm. that group. And, um, and I think, you know, I sort of heard some things echoed in, like in Becca's really excellent talk this morning about the lack of data. We do have, I guess I have a slightly different perspective that we do have a lot of data. It's hard to find. It's not easy to quality control. It's all done by, and I'm just talking about water quality data, say that's in the water quality portal. Um, you know, the, the data piece, I, I think we need to, we need to um, improve. And we, we did talk about this as part of the monitoring group, you know, where are the data sources? And I, what I liked about the process was really the open-ended, oh, is, is it not loud enough? The open, um, you know, we really tried to have an open-ended discussion and broaden things and really ask questions and try to get a, a variety of perspectives. So it wasn't just sort of, you know, what's your list of the easy things, but kind of expanding it out and talking about mm -hmm. what we really need to do that's challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if we think back, uh, you know, to how 
almost a year and a half ago when we um, did the road mapping. Since then, I was involved in some other road mapping activities, and I realized, you know, earlier 2023, that is, whoever you invite to these things is the mm. you get. Yeah, uh, the input informs the output. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, all the, the challenges of getting you know, those right people you know, in the room. So I think back to who was in the room at that time, mm -hmm. and I, I think these are, are fair in terms of, you know, for the people in the room, but none of them... Who might not be? Is it on? But none of them were, in the end, surprising. You know, uh, sure. like you said, we've looked at these other roadmaps, there was no silver bullet, mm -hmm. right? Or no even thing that, uh, you know, looked like um, the Lone Ranger you know, had a loaded gun with some silver bullets, maybe. Right. So I feel like, you know, because of the group think nature, mm -hmm. I wonder if we really missed the high risk, high return type thing. Yeah, all these seem pretty reasonable. That was one, I, I had one other takeaway, but maybe I'll let Jim go and see if he steals it. Uh, I don't know about that, but it, yeah, the process, you're right, exactly. It's always hard to get grower organizations in this room. Mm -hmm. We always have had that challenge all the way back to the Phosphorus RCN back, you know, so we, you know, whatever help can be brought to the table to bring uh, those voices in um, to the effort it would be fantastic. Um, my, you know, looking at this list, so at this event, we haven't talked much about food waste, but it is uh, as an impact, what's missing mm. is diet. Ah. And, you know, our work on diet and the contribution of meat to the phosphorus footprint that, you know, Jen Metzen led showed that, you know, one third of the increased phosphorus use that's occurred globally in the last several decades is due to shifting diet, increasing amounts of phosphorus rich, uh, foot, high footprint meats into diet. And we got to get that up there. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I we talk about I increased awareness for the public, right? But we don't really talk about public behavior change. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. as a research enterprise, you know, last time at the Phosphorus Forum last week in North, last year in North Carolina State, we did have a representative from the cultured right. yeah. stem cell meat organization as a way of replacing, um, you know, conventional um, livestock right. uh, rearing as a source of, of animal protein. Um, whether that's going to go or not is an interesting question. I do mm -hmm. think it's disruptive and has a, has a potential yeah. to have a radical impact if it does get take up. It's not clear mm -hmm. to me yet that it's going to be a goer or not in the right. near future, but we'll see. I hope you know, um, but I think that's missing yep. um, from from our roadmap right now, and I think we need to get it on there. And Jana, you had a, a perspective on that too. Well, yeah, I put a slide up about uh, on the slide set about the footprint. So I don't know when the mm. right time is to talk about that, but I could certainly, I'd be happy to give a little bit of background and stuff that's been done on the, foot, oh, interesting. the footprinting. Yeah. yeah, so it's mm -hmm. in the slide set somewhere there. Yeah, that's great. What, what was the uh, area that was missed for you, Paul? So, um, here's working on. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll come back to this idea of kind of alternative proteins, but to me, like, in, you know, you, you map these out over time. Not you, but, you know, right. the, the yeah. road map, map these out over time. And, you know, kind of reflect, you asked us to reflect back upon what we heard over the last two days. Mm -hmm. And what we heard over the last two days are kind of, uh, you can have a great idea, but there's, you know, kind of marketing influence. Or, right. you know, um, we heard about kind of, you know, economic patterns, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of us were, were looking at Justin's, you know, uh, projections, and he had uh, 20 projections. One was way like this, one was way like this, a bunch in the middle. So it's like, you know, right. who knows, right? So to me, the challenge of, of having these is everyone finds something comfortable to justify their existence, but we need some economic, right. you know, underpinning here to prioritize these like, which one is going to get us close to 25 and 25 in, like, you know, enhanced monitoring? Is that mm -hmm. going to get us to a 25% reduction? I don't know, right? right. I don't understand yeah. how we go from there to this 25 and 25 impacts, and whether it's um, mm -hmm. economics or some other, you know, prioritization I thought was missing. Right, yeah, that that is a, a challenge with this kind of framework, right? Because it it would be really difficult to try to tie, uh, oh, um, we need to do more work on growing markets, right? Develop and grow markets for proven solutions for phosphorus management, right? I don't remember if it was um, Adam or Carl yesterday that was talking about 
Farmers want finished products. They don't want sort of things that are still in trial stage, right? Um, if we think about that alone as a lever, like how much is that going to move us towards 25 and 25 alone? It's hard to tell. Right? It's unclear. Uh, but I think that's one that um, I have a few notes about from the last couple of days. You know, there were a couple points where we were talking about really in terms of dollars, like how expensive is this product going to be or what's the savings going to be. Uh, but I think we can do a lot more there to um, help build the case for farmers. Um, so when you think about signs of progress from the last couple days, um, what things stand out to you as, as successful uh, and what things maybe still worry you? Where do you sort of like see the need to strive for more? I, I was enormously excited this afternoon. Good. Actually, I was seeing things that were really going to impact, you know, so figuring out that sulfur is interfering with phosphorus, you know, we're putting phosphorus down on sulfur deficient fields, right? That's not, they're not going to use, the crops are not going to use that phosphorus very efficiently, right? And so that's going to help. Um, and, you know, I'm still trying to figure out the phospholution solution, but it seemed like something important was, is emerging um, in that strategy, and so that was exciting to me, and, and James's presentation as well. Um, I do think there's stuff, you know, I thought this afternoon was particularly exciting, actually, for me mm -hmm. to see what, what product, what things are coming forward right mm -hmm. now yeah. that are entering the system. Yeah. Okay. One thing that I thought was, um, was really exciting is the interdisciplinarity of this group that, um, you know, I go to a lot of meetings where we kind of have ag, like we're all very focused on ag because I'm working on non-point source issues. And so we, we really focus in on a sector. And even just, you know, maybe it's more like the extension and conservation side of agriculture rather than this kind of upstream, I think somebody described those kinds of things, those kinds of, um, you know, what, what are the products that we're using? How are we using them? And I think that's really important. I, I was also, really excited today to see more social science involved. So the economics, the education work, I think the communications is very important. I had to, I was telling my brother that I was giving a, you know, gonna give a talk about phosphorus and he was like, phosphorus, what's that? Like I, I had to tell him, like explain to him what someone this, what this was. And someone should write a book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. So I'll, I'll be giving him that book. I'll give him a co copy of the book. So I'm just, I was glad to, and like the water quality trading, I think that's really important. Mm. Um, and so uh, also the idea of damage costs. And I think, mm. I think Justin maybe was going to mention, was going to mention this. I was going to follow up with him. Like what are the, we've done a good job on the air side. And that's why the Clean Air Act has been so successful at reducing sulfur and nitrogen oxides and ozone. Um, because we've done all these damage costs related to human health. What are the phosphorus costs and how could, you know, can we do more cost benefit kinds of things or is that what we should be doing? I guess I would, I'm not an economist. I would ask the economist, is that the kind of work that we should be doing? But I was really encouraged to see the multi-sector and the interdisciplinarity of this conference. Mm -hmm. Jen, are you seeing um, coming out now in your sphere the direct human health impacts of, of cyanobacteria like airborne? Um, airborne contaminants and toxins and such. There's, there seems to be more and more of that going on, but I haven't yet seen it coming yeah, out. Yeah, there, there's definitely people at EPA that are working on the airborne. I think it's more of a question at this point. You know, there could be potential airborne um, effects of the cyanotoxins. There's definitely treatment costs that go when you have an algal bloom on a drinking water system, which it happens, you know, it's not infrequent. You know, there's treatment costs. Like the city of Salem had to put in a $25 million treatment post, you know, drinking water treatment system to deal with their fluctuating HAB situation. And so I think some of the, it's maybe not a human, direct human health impact, but it's a preventing human health problems that relates to cost. Yeah, I often think that if we start, if we, if evidence begins to continue, it continues to emerge about those direct um, mm. neurotoxic or or other health impacts of direct impacts of aerosolized or otherwise mobilized uh, toxins for, uh, for people adjacent to uh, mm -hmm. toxic, mm -hmm. toxic algal blooms. I think that's going to create a lot of momentum um, and unfortunately, unfortunate momentum, yeah. I'm afraid yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, an interesting area of, of worry and maybe one for fruitful research. Paul, what about you? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, again, kind of reflecting back over, along the, the last two days, uh, you know, we heard about wastewater treatment plants in North Carolina, and then we heard about, um, you know, the kind of, you know, Intermountain West, and the fact mm. that no matter what you did at a wastewater treatment plant, it would have no effect because of the high background phosphorus from, you know, forest fires or, you know, coming off of public lands, not, mm. you know, in terms of crop lands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when you think about 25 and 25, you know, some of these things maybe in a way that's different than petroleum is, you know, hyper local and mm -hmm. like, how do you bring in that local, you know, ness to these national goals? Because I could do a, I could remove 90% of the phosphorus, it sounds like, at a wastewater treatment plant in Arizona and have no benefit. Um, but mm -hmm. if you do that in one of these, you know, sensitive ecosystems, you may not totally prevent eutrophication, but you could significantly reduce it. And so I'm just, I have a hard time, but I think it was well articulated over the last two days that uh, we need to do a better job understanding how this 25 and 25 vision, you know, could be actually helpful or harmful in terms of how it's applied in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe part of that gets back to like when we do research projects, thinking about what's the benefit that we want to provide to whom, mm -hmm. right? Because if we're thinking about the to whom, we might realize, ah, if we're seeking to help uh, Arizona, wastewater treatment plants are maybe not mm -hmm. the place to focus our energy, right? right. right. Yeah. yeah. Other worries? Worries. Ah, that, that's yeah. So, you know, so I, I, I heard, not. you know, the, the other one I heard today, and after the fires in Canada, a number of us kind of circulated. Then I heard it again today about the forest fires in the mm. West, and that there are many natural processes that are occurring that's moving a lot of phosphorus around that we don't know too much about. I suspect a lot of the phosphorus in some of those, you know, dusts and, um, and forest fire smoke is actually, you know, inorganic orthophosphate, pretty like little quick little pulses, you know, being injected into these surface waters compared to um, maybe what happens after a runoff event or something. And, and so they might be, you know, very different in terms of their, their impact. So, you know, I, not that I worry about this, but I, I, you know, we did stuff on kind of the global flux of, you know, nanomaterials and iron. And it turned out that these natural processes swamped out, mm. you know, a lot of the, the human ones on a large scale, mm -hmm. not on the hyper-local scale, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, wonder some of these, uh, you know, dust transport processes, forest fire impacts, if we understand what they are or where they're, you know, impacting things the most. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I would just say that, you know, we were interested, if, I'll put on my Flathead Lake Biological Station hat now. So Flathead Lake is a beautiful, very oligotropic lake in northern in western Montana, and we have great data there, 40 years of loading data, nutrient loading and nutrient data there. Nutrient levels in that lake are very constant, actually. The loading of phosphorus and has actually been declining uh, slowly over time, possibly because the, the, all the developments in, in towns in the, in the area, most of them have tertiary wastewater treatment since the early 80s, so we've really got a handle on the local sources of phosphorus. And I was just interviewed by a local newspaper the other day or whatever because we're having a 125th anniversary of a station and talk about the lake and what, you know, what worried me about the lake and what worried me about the lake besides invasive species, which is another story entirely, was large-scale forest fire. Mm. Um, if we get fires to the scale like they're having, they had in Canada this past summer. Right. And the, the risk of those, of course, is increasing with climate change. So to me, it's like large-scale fire mobilizing large amounts of nutrients in the watershed directly mm -hmm. um, is, the big, for me, the, one of the biggest worries. And mm -hmm. that's a phosphorus worry. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah I, I guess I wonder how, when these things happen, mm -hmm. either, uh, you know, a war that affects transportation, forest fires, right. like where in you know, this roadmap is this quick response, you know, yeah. how do we become this trusted source to provide this information, mm -hmm. you know, quickly. I don't know, within the EPA, this happens 
frequently there's a train derailment, yeah. right? And something then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, call out the, the hot shots, right, to, to answer it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we have those quick response mm -hmm. types of things to these events that have a, a short window of time to get the public's attention, good or bad, right. but, you know, it's an opportunity to, to educate with kind mm -hmm. of be a, um, you know, a, a sounding board of true science as opposed to just kind of reacting to things. But I, I don't know, within the EPA, who's responsible for this, for these yeah. nutrient things? Yeah, I don't know. It really depends. Um, I, will, I will say when we had the fires in, the Labor Day fires in Oregon in 2020, we have, you know, we do a lot of watershed work, so we had a team of scientists that just got together. We, we went out and took samples at about 150 sites all across the state, some that burned, some that didn't burn, within a week of the fire. So there, there are ways, like if there's a will and there's people up above us who are supportive of that to be able to provide the funding to do the water chemistry analysis. You know, there, is, there are some mechanisms. That was very ad hoc, though. It was just, you know, let's put a team together to do this. You know, there certainly are um, the, you know, the frontline emergency kind of response through EPA for something like East Palestine or other big, big things that happen. Um, so, you, you know, incorporating that. Do that. I mean, you no. have uh, exercises. Don't, you know, I, I know that this is true for other types of spills that, you know, or like a war game, mm -hmm. right? You're given teams, you know, a challenge or they don't know what the challenge is going to be. But it's like, how do they respond? Who do they contact? And I, I wonder if, you know, within this, these kind of shorter term things, if having, you know, some of this like practiced war game types of things would be an interesting approach mm. to see how we respond yeah. to things. Uh, yeah. But again, it's the time scales. Like right. to me, yeah. you you know, you keep going back. What did we miss or right. things? So I think we got like big chunks of things, mm -hmm. but I don't know if we understand the temporal nature of some of these things. Yeah, absolutely. I think the temporal nature shows up most strongly in the enhanced enhanced monitoring section where that team, kind of the, the vision that that small group put together was one of sort of very real time, um, continuous monitoring of nutrient flows um, with citizen science being a like particularly enabling kind of factor for that. Um, is that something you think like STEPS has a role in in the future or what's kind of the EPA's perspective on um, how to engage the general public in those kinds of Yeah, situations. I can't really speak to the citizen science question, but I do want to say, like, for example, on the deposition issue, um, you know, NADP, the National Atmospheric Deposition, Deposition Program, they do a lot to, mo to measure and monitor atmospheric pollution. They didn't, they haven't historically looked at phosphorus, but because of the changes that have been happening and the patterns that are going on, they, you know, they measure it, they just don't report it. So now they're looking at that data, trying to develop quality control procedures so that they can actually publish the phosphorus part of that deposition. So, you know, that's, that's just one small thing that could help with some of these forest fire questions, because they go out every month. Like, you can look at that data. That's, it's great data. I encourage you to look at NADP and look at the trends in, over time and all of the elements. They're trying to add a phosphorus component to this and that would be something that the steps mm. group could say, yes, mm -hmm. we, we need this information. We want to you know, make sure, like, please keep providing this and we can help you test it or whatever, you know, whatever the appropriate um, connection is there. Yeah. So in terms of the, the citizen science, I don't know, right? You know, I think uh, some other things we've, we've done um, and heard examples of really successful citizen science programs. The most successful one I've ever heard is you know, it taps into something that citizens care about or groups of citizens care about. Mm. So the one that I really heard was like these birders, right? And so it turns out that birders have a really good social network of citizen science. And mm. they go out all the time, they count birds, no one's telling them to do it, no one's paying, it's not a regulation, it's not, you know, but it's their passion. Right. right. I don't know, you know, what community has the, <laughs> this like phosphorus passion. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, you know, maybe we have to try to find a way to connect it to something, mm -hmm. uh, and just you know, I don't know how many people see birds and how much poop comes from a bird. And, like I don't know, <laughs> right? But I, yeah. you know, it seems like the citizen science, you can't force it. It right. has to be 
enabled by some deeper passion, I think. Well, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of examples. There's a lot of passion around lakes out there, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they're good examples. The North American Lake Management Society has something called the Secchi Dip-In. <laughs> A secchi <laughs> disc is a white disc you lower into the lake to, until it disappears and measures water clarity, and that happens. Uh, and they got a fair amount of data out there for that. Um, in West, putting on my Montana hat again, in Western Montana, we have um, there was a long time a mongering lake sampling program that, that contributed data to the Department of Environmental Quality in Montana. And at the biological station, we have created something called Monitoring Montana's Waters which is philanthropically supported, but essentially it's where our personnel provide help citizen groups around certain watersheds develop the expertise for sampling, for quality control, for chain of uh, possession mm -hmm. documentation, and then bring samples to um, reputable labs to get data on the nutrient status of and, waters, and water quality status of their river, or their stream, their lake. And uh, it's been growing pretty well. Um, I love that program. I think it's great. I think citizen science is great. I do think, however, since I have an EPA representative here, that you know it's the duty of the federal government and state governments to monitor the health of the essential resources of our nation, sure. and we should not pass that responsibility off to you know us. <laughs> um, we, we should take. We should be getting much better data on a much regular basis uh, as part of our. Um, organized efforts at the federal and state level. Right. Um, but to the extent that that's not happening, uh, you know, citizen groups will, ri you know, will arise to get information about the systems that they love, and we can harness that passion. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So in the last kind of third of our discussion, let's um, shift to kind of be forward looking. When we come together next year for PFORM 2025, maybe in, uh, Jim, where, where are we looking at? Uh, north, yeah, north, uh, probably North Carolina State, um, yeah, so in Raleigh, and, and during Phosphorus Week, during uh, the 15th week of the year, I think that's the uh, Phosphorus Forum is likely going, that's we now talked at the board meeting yesterday, ah, and right. the board is supportive of that date and, and that location, so we can all look forward to that. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah. So, so when we come together at that point, while you have kind of a lot of the researchers that are likely going to be there next year, sort of what, what does success look like to you? Um, for 2025, what's one sort of research-related question that you really want the folks in this room to tackle over the next year? Uh, well, I've already said it. We need more about. <laughs> we need. We need get to get some uh, uh, food waste uh, work right. uh, going and get some people representing some that that, that process here. And then I think we need more attention on diet. And uh, we had some last year's forum, but I think mm -hmm. next year we want to start filling that gap as well. And again, we need uh, more voices from the from the grower community in the room with us. Um, and so the help we can get from our stakeholders here to make that happen next year, that will look like success. So there's missing sectors here uh, this year, you know, and it's hard to fill in all the gaps on a, such a complex problem, but I would hope one, one measure of success is that we will have filled mm -hmm. um, some, of the, some of the gaps in, in representation. So I think, uh, you know, I really enjoyed hearing from the struggles and opportunities and uh, enthusiasm of some of the starter startup companies or younger mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, you know, maybe think about that in some other sectors, you know, um, rather than uh, the fertilizer ones, which mm -hmm. we heard about today. Uh, you know, really feeding on, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is this alternative protein space. Right. So um, and find you know advocates, startup companies in that space. So one is this Good Food Institute. Mm -hmm. They're really trying to change, you know, uh, behavior of mm -hmm. people or to at least understand how do you get to 10% of a food supply that is an alternative protein. So trying to understand that trajectory in there and like why did they pick 10% and mm. what do they think within this alternative proteins are the winners and losers, mm -hmm. but there's different, you know, ways to go about doing that, whether it's cultured meat or fermentation or kind of re-engineering, you know, um, different crops to have different textures and different, you know, flavor profiles. But if, if that, if that's the one that you go with just re-engineering soybeans, maybe that doesn't change the right. phosphorus footprint. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to see, like a different sector altogether kind of represented. Great. Uh, yeah. you know, to augment kind of you know, what's here, but to, to make it bigger and a little bit more 
I think, understanding the future trajectory more than right. like where we are today. Yeah, we know it's such a complex problem, right? right. We need a complex and diverse set of sectors yeah. represented to tackle it. Janet, what about you? What is a successful 2025 yeah, so reform I, look like? I have um, some things that I thought about yesterday, and I don't see the folks who were speaking yesterday in the group about the um, agricultural technologies and all of the data that's going to be collected on farm. So I, and it kind of connects to the grower question because I work, we do projects on production farmland and so I interact with farmers like week, on a weekly basis we were going out and collecting water from leaching projects and there's kind of this idea that they don't want you to know what's going on on their property but also they want to get credit for good things that they're doing and so there's kind of this little bit of a knife edge there of different perspectives and so I really feel strongly about having some kind of data that is gathered on these enhanced efficiency fertilizers for example I'm really glad to hear that we're going to have things in the APCO um, you know, registry that will show up as enhanced efficiency fertilizers, other kinds of fertilizers, but at some scale, reporting on those practices and what kinds of things people are doing in terms of nutrient management. It doesn't have to be, you know, geolocated. It doesn't have to be on a particular farm, but there must be some scale at which we can look, we can know the, the broader community, the public can know what people are doing as far as fertilizer management or nutrient management or nutrient use mm -hmm. on the ground so that we can do a better job of connecting the water quality to the nutrient on field nutrient management. So that's kind of my, that's my hill that I'll be standing on maybe <laughs> slightly on a slightly different hill but close to where Becca is standing. But I, feel, I really feel like there must be some scale at which that data could be shared. So I'd, I'd love to continue those kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. That's the great. At the next meeting. Good, good, yeah. And then you had uh, a couple comments. You added a slide about uh, environmental footprints. Right? Yeah, Did you I just was going to share these, these footprint. Um, this on the left is we had a special issue about environmental footprints, and it sounds like you all are well aware of Jen Metzen's work on nitrogen. She's a sun devil. Footprint. Yeah, she is. I, I, she was on my slide with the little arrow <laughs> and the forks up. Um, and then also we developed this tool, and I put a link to it there, assuming that these slides are going to get out to folks, but it's a tool. It was developed for the University of Virginia, but you all could use it for Arizona State or University of Arkansas or wherever, and um, it allows you to look at carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and water footprints all together. We'd love to look at the economic cost as well, but we don't have that for phosphorus. Um, but these are, you know, these are some tools that are out there, also the nitrogen footprint, if Folks are not aware of that, um, that Jim Galloway and his uh, many people working with him developed um, in the SIMAP tool, which is the, the what a lot of universities use to track carbon. We've added nitrogen into that. EPA project helped add nitrogen into the SIMAP tool that most universities use to calculate their carbon footprint if anybody's working in the sustainability office. So I just wanted to, Jim kind of already mentioned the footprint Great. idea, but I think I feel like our individual actions are important, but we also have to have help from the industries that we mm -hmm. buy from and we mm -hmm. buy our food from, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, I'll just flip back over here, open it up to the room if there are any kind of final questions from any of you for uh, any of the four of us before we hand off to Ross to close things out. Becca has one. Becca. So I, I like the idea of thinking about like what's missing from the diagram and while well, diet, important, uh, you gotta change eight billion people's minds, right? That's not hard. Um, what about ethanol? 40% uh, of corn in the US going to our cars, is that, that's not on there? Is that uh, low, lower hanging, you think it's lower hanging fruit than changing, I, I, I'm not a policy person, I don't, changing one policy or a couple policies versus eight billion people, I don't know, what's harder? The policy one, that's the one. When I give my phosphorus sustainability talk, that's on my list. It's like why are, we, why are we putting so much fertilizer into corn ethanol when it's carbon benefits are at least debatable, right? There's some people who think that it's definitely carbon beneficial. Others arguing that it's actually harmful on the, when you put the whole carbon footprint into the corn ethanol equation, it comes out that you're still emitting carbon from the uh, net. 
So yeah, so that you're you're right. That's another thing that's missing. So food systems. That's a food system. How much non-food agriculture do we do? Mm. The, the when we use valuable, precious fertilizer, with its environmental risks, we should focus that use, in my opinion, on feeding people, and that means feeding people, not necessarily feeding animals, <laughs> and then feeding people. So that's a diet issue, but also. Um, non-food use like corn ethanol or other agricultural bioenergy efforts, which I think are, uh, there are other alternatives for replacing that uh, fuel carbon that aren't, don't mm -hmm. involve farming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Justin. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, maybe I'll um, uh, not really build off of Becca's question, but I do want to think about what's missing. And we've talked a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, over the last couple of days about new and emerging markets for phosphate rock, um, EV battery technology in particular. And I do wonder if we need to be thinking more about these kind of new uses of phosphate that may or may not have, um, you know, lower environmental impacts, but there's still probably ways that we could get out of the head of the curve and think about sustainable, um, you know, management Mm -hmm. regimes, paradigms for these new and emerging markets. So is that something that we need to be considering more intently? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that university researchers and partnerships with, you know, um, federal agencies, you know, whether it's you know, DOE or others that are looking at technology roadmaps on, in other sectors and trying to somehow screen those other sectors I think that's pretty easy to do, right? You know, and I think uh, you know, checking a box yes or no makes us kind of this informed source, right? So where do people go to answer that question? Right now, there isn't a place, right? So we could be the place, and maybe the answer is it's negligible or there's a 2% risk. But if we knew that, I think then we'd become this more you know, c credible you know, source not that we're not credible, mm. that, you know, this kind of go-to source for national reporters mm -hmm. when this comes up. I mean, we see this a lot here in Arizona around the Colorado River. Um, you know, the New York Times and others are calling people in Arizona because we're at the front lines, but there it becomes a credibility, you know, opportunity uh, for, for this group. And then if you become more credible on those things, presumably when someone asks you in Iowa about uh, ethanol, you, you can at least sound credible and not opinionated necessarily. So, so I think it's really important over the next, you know, over the life cycle of steps is to build this credibility. So then people keep coming to us. Yeah, I, I would just say the Phosphorus Alliance seeks to be that yeah. drawing point too when people have questions about phosphorus. And, you know, even if we don't have it at the moment, we're going to be a credible uh, entity to go find the answers and give the best assessment. So what is the difference between, what, like how, how are, are these all one things? We have P Week, we have, you know, SPA, we have STEPS, we have, I don't know, a bunch of acronyms. The Phosphorus Alliance was be here before STEPS and oh, we're going to okay. outlive you. <laughs> right. So, well, so that, um, that's, that's important though, right? I mean, but I think that's good, yeah. right? So what are we missing? Like, is there a third or fourth organization that exists that, you know, you think you compete with that actually should be be here. You asked, you know, what should we have next time? Mm -hmm. Is there another organization we should have here that you're, you not feel well, threatened we have, We've joined forces with the SPP, which is the European equivalent of the Phosphorus Alliance. So mm -hmm. they're always present and we always enjoy interacting with them. I don't think we compete with them necessarily. Do they have a roadmap that, uh, or something that you know, we could? Veronica, do you have a roadmap? Are you interested in a roadmap? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Would it be okay. very different, you think? No. Okay. All right. I thought our phosphorus future, in many ways, is a uh, kind of a European-centric document. Although it is global, but it was driven mm -hmm. by the yeah the but United now, Kingdom. So, Kerry, you you work you know your, your mm -hmm. RTI works on lots of roadmaps. You were saying. Sure. I wonder yeah. if you know are there other some roadmap like little tangential, maybe not. Com you know, in the exact same phosphorus arena, is there one on nitrogen or, I don't know, something that, mm -hmm. you know, we could learn from or, you know, help each other? Maybe mm -hmm. a, a battery. I'm sure somebody has a battery roadmap out there, right? There are many battery ones. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I would just say that the roadmap is a boundary object, right? Yeah. It's, it's plays the same function as, right. the, as the phosphorus flow diagram that we use in steps, right? So this roadmap is another thing. It's a touch point for people to enter the problem from. 
And part of their entry is to say, well, this is missing. You forgot this part, or that's overemphasized. You should, you should de-emphasize. It's a place for, to, to start to organize discussion right. and organize thinking. So um, I'm glad we're doing it. I'm glad we do it. I mean, I think we should always just see it as a living document. And you know, you know, when steps goes through, it's maybe part of the steps renewal will be mm -hmm. to you know revise it based on all the things we learned yeah. during the first five years, right? And um, based on more input from our community. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's a boundary object. It's a talking point. It helps you know us think about things. But mm -hmm. as we've said, you know, there's shortfalls in it and and uh, places we need to work. Yeah. And if you, know, if you want to go deeper on this question of sort of overlap between roadmaps, there's an appendix at the back that kind of does that crosswalk of, here's what we said was important in our roadmap, here's how we map to our phosphorus future and mm -hmm. refocus in the UK and uh, a few others. Jess? Kind of following up on talking about the roadmap as a boundary object and it being a living document and wanting to have that input to continue to change it. Short of getting growers in the room here, how else are you all planning on trying to reach out to them to communicate it and make sure they're aware of it and be kind of uh, getting some of that feedback from all of these other groups? Hmm. Carrie? <laughs> Jess asking the hard questions. Wow. Okay. So um, we've we thought a good bit about this, actually. And I think one of the barriers, in, in my mind, and like, Maybe Carl would have thoughts about it or others that spend more time interfacing with growers is, I don't really know exactly what that conversation would even look like for us to come with a roadmap and say, hey, here's what we think is important for phosphorus management. They're gonna go, how does that help me? Okay, um, yeah, if you want me to be more efficient and that helps me save money, sure, that, right? They're interested, but I, I don't know beyond that. I, I have a hard time envisioning kind of what that conversation looks like. Um, so I would love fresh ideas from anybody in the room about like, what's the right way to spark that conversation? Yeah, I think Jacob. That, uh, next year, keep talking, check one, two, whatever. <laughs> next year there'll be a unique opportunity if this event is hosted in North Carolina State to bring in extension agents, which mm -hmm. is a direct conduit to growers. Um, and I think that's not mm -hmm. only from North Carolina, but we could think about other major agricultural states like uh, Illinois and Florida, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one suggestion I'd have, we did it at Purdue, and it, it worked really well, is we would have, and it's Purdue Farms, not Purdue University, um, we would have uh, a farmer, pa farmer panels, and essentially, mm -hmm. You know, come up with a topic, talk about, okay, your, your phosphorus use, and get four or five farmers to sit up on the stage and ask them questions about, like, hey, this is what we're trying to push with phosphorus. What, how does this impact you? Because right. back to your point, it, it, what's the whiff them, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to do it if, yeah. if, if there's nothing in it for them. Yeah. Um, but, but you do have farmers who, who are concerned about their children, their grandchildren, the, the optics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our farmers got beat up all the time on the Purdue farm side, and a lot of times it was it was not correct in what they're getting beat up on. So, so it was good hearing those different perspectives, and mm. that might be an idea. So. so, when you did this with Purdue Farms, uh, how do you find four or five that aren't, uh, uh, you know, overly um, advocates, or like how how do you make it a like a, a you know a relatively representative panel? Uh, that's a good question. We had, we had a really good, uh, our chief animal care officer was really good at building those relationships okay. with farmers. Mm. Um, it, it, it was where it worked well and it was amazing. So we, they would have an animal care summit. Of course, we would take chickens and harvest them uh, by the millions. So, so we'd have all the NGOs that were about animal care there and then bring the farmers that actually grew the chickens to talk to them. So, so it really was just trying to vet out, you know, who, who isn't maybe off the rails with what they're thinking, but mm -hmm. also could give perspective to these people. Mm -hmm. um, and it did, it did work really well. I mean, I, I was shocked. Uh, they started it the year I started there, 2015, and mm -hmm. um, the, the feedback from the NGOs was, was awesome. That, you know, look, we never thought we'd sit down with a big chicken company and have this conversation. That's great. So. So maybe you could awesome. find farmers mm -hmm. that use phosphate rock or, you know, uh, animal manure, manure or yeah. organic or, 
you know, um, you know, they use, you know, sludges from wastewater treatment plants, maybe get mm -hmm. different types of users of fertilizer, yeah. maybe. No, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. And maybe our extension agents can be part of that, mm. that can bring that relationship and be kind of part of that conduit. Yeah. Well, great ideas. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to our panelists. <laughs>